Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Esther Leslie, and I'm a member of the editorial board of Historical Materialism. Welcome to the book launch of Gal Kern's Partisan Counter Archive, Retracing the Ruptures of Art and Memory in the Yugoslav People's Liberation Struggle and Beyond. I'm going to introduce our main speaker and the respondents and then say a few words about the book and then open it up to um, to Gal to begin. So Gal Kern is uh, based at Novogorica University uh, in Slovenia, uh, though lives or is to be found at times in Berlin. Um, he was uh, a political theorist at the TU Dresden for a while, has been a researcher at the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht, a research fellow at ICI Berlin, and a fellow at Stuttgart's Academy Schloss Solitude. The first thing I read from Gal uh, was an essay he wrote in 2017, a really brilliant essay on Eisenstein, Vertov, and Med Medvedkin, revolutionary sinification and communist subjectivity. But that's just one tiny part of um, his research and what he has written. He's written and edited books on neoliberalism, theories of post-Fordism, on Althusser, on riots, um, on Yugoslav black wave cinema and uh, more. I think he's currently working with Katja Diffenbach and Peter Thomas uh, on uh, some work on Althusser. So, Gal is going to speak tonight in this session for around 25 minutes, bringing out the key theses of his book. And that's going to be followed by some responses. And I want to introduce you to our respondents first. So we'll hear from Angela Dimitrakaki, who is a writer and a senior lecturer in contemporary art history and theory at the University of Edinburgh. And she writes on um, feminism, on Marxist methodologies in art history, on art and curating in relation to labor, production, and reproduction, feminist politics and history, um, and art and culture in the context of post-1989 Europe, and many other issues within aesthetics and political questions. And I know her from a... Uh, more recently, um, through a particular emphasis on anti-fascism and culture and art, and um, was really glad to be edited by her for a special edition of Third Text on anti-fascism and art. Um, in Greece and in the Greek language, she's also a celebrated novelist, and she was once on the editorial board of Historical Materialism um, and continues to be a great supporter of the journal as corresponding editor and she's on the editorial board of third text and our second respondent will be Sezgin Boynik who lives and works in Helsinki um, he did his PhD um, at a university whose pronunciation I've not practiced Yuviskela University in the Social Science Department. That was on the topic of cultural politics of the black wave in Yugoslavia from 1963 to 1972. So you can see how Gal and Sezgin have interests in common. He's worked on many themes, uh, including Russian formalism, uh, Lenin's devices of language, um, Turkish punk, um, He's founder and editor of Rab Rab, Journal for Political and Formal Inquiries in Art, which is how I came to meet him. Rab Rab is, is an excellent, fascinating journal of intense revolutionary and aesthetic theory, but it also um, oversees a great press which publishes books on Soviet avant-garde. Uh, more recently, it was a book on the politics of jazz um, and pertinent to tonight's discussion there was a reprint very recently of E.P. Thompson's memoirs The Railway An Adventure in Construction which uh, was getting out there a, a, a somewhat forgotten book or barely a book in a sense 
put out in a beautiful edition by Rab Rab. Um, and it's by E.P. Thompson, the historian, detailing the experience of socialist British youth volunteers working on constructing the railway from Shamak to Sarajevo in Yugoslavia in 1947. And Seskin's currently working with um, researchers and artists based in Prague, producing a book on the um, historical meaning and current resonances of the theoretical work of the Marxist surrealist Karel Tiger. So our respondents will follow Gal speaking for 10 to 15 minutes each, and then I'll invite Gal back in to comment on those responses and perhaps a discussion will develop between all of us. After that, we'll be drawing on questions and comments that you, the virtual audience, will be communicating to us through the YouTube channel, um, taking as many of those as we think will make the basis of a good discussion. So before I bring Gal in, I just wanted to say a few words to introduce the book and the topic. Um, now, I know mo most of you here will already know the title and the subject matter, but one thing to point out is that this volume, Partisan Counter Archive, is a companion volume or sequel to an earlier book that uh, Gal published with Pluto Press, which was called Partisan Ruptures, Self-Management, Market Reform and the Spectre of Socialist Yugoslavia. And it very much sort of operates in the same space, but where that was a more philosophically and politically focused work, this book that we're launching tonight um, is much more around the politics of memory, of, of art and literature um, as, as, as sort of part of, of both the political struggle and a, a, a legacy that um, is either carried forward into the future or eradicated or mobilised in particular ways for particular ends. And the first thing to say, as I think the respondents will say, is that this is a really fascinating book quite a complex book that gives us much more than a survey of the art, artistic and cultural responses produced by the partisans who were fighting against fascism um, in the Second World War. That would be enough in itself. Uh, one of the things that, that comes out from the book is this extraordinary efflorescence of poetry amongst partisans and activists. The book, though, goes beyond that because as a political work, as one expects from political work, it's not just an academic exercise in literary criticism. It's framed by the present, specifically by what has occurred through the post-socialist transition as Yugoslavia broke into different states. What is the setting for um, these acts of reclamation of political art, which is, in a sense, what, what Gal is doing by bringing them out of the archives and showing them to us and talking through them. The setting in which one operates is one in which concepts such as anti-totalitarianism and transition to capitalism have become pertinent. And the first chapter of the book develops the key theoretical framework that Gal sets to work throughout the book. And that's where the notion of the counter archive is crucial and further the counter archive surplus. That is that which has not hitherto been contained within the archives or available through the archives because it exceeds their categories. It's something eruptive, something truly revolutionary or emancipatory. On this basis, Gal works through the specific historical context of partisan encounters between art and politics in the Yugoslav context of the Second World War. What are those politics? What he brings out is the revolutionary aspects, the gripping of revolutionary ideas by the masses and by communist organization as they 
carry out anti-fascist struggle. On this basis, we move to look at the counter archive, at the many examples of partisan made and partisan informed poems, films, photographs and graphic art. The book moves on to explore socialist Yugoslavia and how that partisan legacy was memorialized, used as a kind of founding uh, aspect or justification for the Yugoslav state. What kind of memory can sustain that role of nation building and that type of ideological work? In what ways was the partisan legacy carried on as well artistically? Of course, the book then has to move on to look at the aftermath, the situation after the mid 1980s as the state form of Yugoslavia changes violently through war and through re economic readjustments. In what way was the, the Yugoslav past and the partisan contribution eradicated, changed, mobilized? What types of revisionism were at work and how did they manifest themselves in historical public memory? in monuments, in films, in officially sanctioned ideologies, or in kitschy tokens that wiped out meaning in favor of nostalgia. Of course, behind all of this, all of this effort and achievement within the book, there is a purpose to reclaim past, present, and future, and to think more broadly about what it means to gather history under the sign of the decolonial, the public, or under the sign of collective history aimed at resistance and liberation. So what are the uses of history, archive and memory? So on that basis, having given you a, a, a small window onto the expanse of the book, I'd like to invite Gal to take us into some more specific aspects of the work. Thank you, Gal. Thank you very much, Esther. Uh, this was a uh, very nice uh, introduction. I don't have to say uh, anything of my first paragraph now, um, which is good to save the time. I will speak around 25 minutes. Before I do that, uh, I would like to thank um, HM organizers, uh, fellow participants on the panel and the virtual public that we don't see, um, but hope you are that you will stay with us uh, tonight. Um, I would also like to say that uh, this is my first uh, book launch. I'm very proud that it happened under the umbrella of historical materialism. It was published hardcover and ebook, and at the moment it's a ridiculously high price. In a year time, probably there will be paperback and also stuff will be probably accessible uh, Pirate Bay. Um, uh, for those of you that really want to have this book, uh, what was originally meant to be um, sold in London by the Greuter um, was a dozen of books priced on 20 euros. So uh, terrible self-promotion, but if somebody really wants to have a book for 20 euros instead of 85 euros, you can contact me by email or whatever, by chat, and uh, I send it to you. So, as you know, it's a hard task to um, condense 300 pages into 25 minutes. Uh, let's give it a shot. Um, so I'll say a few words on the general frame of my project where I intervened, a um, few words on the counter archive or counter archival surplus uh, in what way that might be different of uh, some other projects uh, that are there. A um, few words on partisan liberation that I conceive as revolution and also present a case or two at the end. Uh, so you get the feeling what is this material that I, that I work on. Mm. But very first thing to answer is one valid question that Quite a few comrades asked me when I was writing the book, is there any kind of Marxian theory of memory? Um, and one of the rare referential thinkers on this realm, uh, Enzo Traverso, argues, quote, Marxism and memory appear as two foreign continents. So also Marxist theory in general has reproduced a conventional, but 
one can claim outdated division between history and memory between objective science and subjective testimonials that speaks a bit on the absence of Marx and theory in the field of uh, memory studies. Furthermore, if we contextualize the recent theoretical history, we can argue that around the mid 1980s, you have um, a specific conjuncture of this missed encounter between Marxian theory and uh, memory studies. So you have a kickoff of memory studies and what will be later called archive fever with the real we have uh, a lot of things done in um, Holocaust and Shoah as an important film comes out. Different monuments, there will be a moment, a moment of counter monuments. You have Pierre Nora and stuff. And interestingly, displacement of the figure of the oppressed, dispossessed, whatever, to the figure of victim. So this is one important uh, uh, a part of this conjuncture. And up until today, the memory studies or the curricula uh, exclude uh, most of Marx or Marxian theorists. On the other hand, 1980s is also marked by the turn to post-Marxism or crisis of Marxism, crisis of history that saw communism as the necessary goal. So kind of this teleologic, teleological approach. There are, however, a few worthy exceptions that kind of frame also my project or that you will find them sometimes as explicit, some, sometimes also as implicit references uh, that I would say it's a kind of Marxian critical memory studies. So especially those that follow the work of Walter Benjamin, uh, perhaps most famously Susan Buck Morse, even if she uses the denomination communism without Marxism. So she perceived herself as a communist, but not as Marxist, or at moments quite anti-Marxian. Uh, there is a work of Ernst Bloch, uh, writing on utopia especially, and which actually points to a very dialectical relations between memory and future. So kind of this anticipatory uh, moments. And in the moment we turn to memory to future and speak about utopia, so this is one of the uh, very important, uh, um, let's say, relationships of these different temporalities, Marxist theories, of course, because of use, becomes much richer. Uh, think of work of Frederick Jameson, of Darko Sovin, and uh, many others. And also Marx himself was not only historical materialist, but also dialectical materialist. And in his works, this projective dimension, orientation to future, both in theory and politics, are quite present or clear. So in a way, if I started saying there is no uh, Marx or Marxian theory in memory studies, actually is the it should be the opposite around. Like every Marxist theorist should be also good or versed in thinking with memory and not just with history. So this is a part of certain uh, uh, um, also crisis of this end of history or crisis of end of end of uh, uh, hope to which I come a little bit later. So. Another important reference, uh, Raymond Williams, who, who has important contributions on archive in terms of uh, literature, but also television, um, kind of mobilization of certain revolutionary hope or revolutionary material. So he's quite explicit in making this link clear. And more recently, in terms of critique of historical revisionism, certain neoconservative agenda that comes together with neoliberalism. We have Domenico Lusurdo and Enzo Traverso that I already mentioned in his left-wing melancholia. I would add that to this theoretical frame, there is an array of fascinating uh, artistic and political uh, initiatives uh, that have been working in last decades on decolonizing, deprivatizing and denationalizing but denationalizing uh, in a sense of national archive. So the archive of presentism is a kind of synthesis of capitalist realism and nation state. So after two decades of defeats and drawback after 89, after the end of hope, so to speak, Marxist theory 
again sails much better became a very important uh, theoretical formation also uh, invested in political struggles around democratic socialism perhaps memory studies um, are now academically established but have lost certain appeal and valency so maybe these 30 years uh, uh, kind of show again uh, on certain turn if a mid 80s was the kind of start of the boom of memory studies now it, memory studies have basically not frozen but become like a very academic uh, discipline um, while uh, Marxian Marxian theoretical frame is becoming more and more powerful in in in, in our theoretical and political struggles so the gist of this book is that the time is ripe for certain reinauguration of Marx and critical memory studies. And it also tries to offer theoretical view on the rich terrain of the memory wars in the socialist post-socialist context. And at the same time work on the method to retrieve the emancipatory fragments of the past for different future. So as already Esther was saying, this book clearly intervenes into cer certain anti-totalitarian nationalist ideology that becomes dominant, not just with the breakup of Yugoslavia, but uh, generally with the, with, with the former East. Um, and in the post-Yugoslav uh, context, also on the left, uh, we have, of course, different interpretations or critical orientations about why the breakup or how did it happen, what was the most important things. So this is not a certain closed story or fait accompli, so to speak. Um, if I simplify, there is at least two uh, major orientation on a more critical uh, 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 trajectories. Uh, so first is, of course, the more Marxian analysis of transitions, tackling um, the privatizations of social property, denationalization, and so on. Uh, the crony capitalism, gradual end of socialist welfare state. Um, and this um, maybe one of the more critical moments of um, people uh, joining this, this wagon is that hyperbolically at least, it, they make capitalism guilty of everything. So even of wars, of nationalist sorts. So nationalism politics always comes as some kind of secondary instance or a secondary uh, phenomenon. Mm. Second orientation is what I would call a kind of left liberal perspective, um, concentrated on the critique of ethnic nationalism, uh, new political elites, Milosevic, Kuchan or now Yansha or Tujman and so on, uh, media cultural analysis. And here nationalism becomes a primal mover of history. So even though they are critical towards a kind of excesses of nationalism, they remain in this kind of national patriotic or kind of liberal patriotic theme of transparency. Everything would be good if uh, there would be normal functioning of liberal democratic institutions and so on. So this orientation, a part of um, a more kind of this liberal political agenda, it doesn't account for some kind of more structural view. So introductory chapter um, does not reconcile, doesn't want to reconcile these two views. Um, it is clearly uh, Marxian, uh, my approach, but what it does do um, with these internal criticisms of this debate is uh, to show on specific articulation of politics, ideology and economy that enter Althusser Dixit, so the relationship between determination and overdetermination. So in the times of nationalist mobilization of late 1980s and beginning of 1990s, when we saw displacement of class antagonism and enhanced contradiction of proto-capitalist logic of late self-management, we could speak of a process that I named after Marx, primitive accumulation of memory by new nation states or accumulation of memory by state. So this, Accumulation of memory is integral to understanding primitive accumulation of capital in post-socialism. So it puts a display for reparation and fueling of general violence in its symbolic and very concrete forms. In retrospect, 
historical revisionism not, was not just some obscurantist academic exercise that resulted in historic strife. Rather, it has yielded deep material effects in the whole former East, we can say, and it becomes a vital force that reorganizes ideological state apparatuses. So think of an array of textbooks, documentaries, museums, exhibition spaces, uh, production of um, books, memory culture, and monuments that revised history. Memorial landscape and writing of history was under permanent deconstruction or even destruction and appropriate nationalist reconstruction ever since. Think about reinventing national myths and traditions from the kingdoms of the Middle Ages to antiquity of Macedonia and Alexander the Great that came with the construction of the political field through categories of eternal enemies internal and external animosities that are uh, most notably linked to religion and ethnicity. So wither away the class, but wither away also of some kind of critical uh, intersectional approach. Um, such ideological mobilizing of the masses came in parallel with demonization of communist partisans past. So this is what I call some kind of damnatio memoria, damnation of memory of communism that is seen as violent, as aberration in national past, while the only one way ahead, one nation in one state in, on the capitalist horizon. We had our dose of make a country great again, uh, make Slovenia great again, make Croatia, make Serbia great again, but also not forget, make Germany great again. Like we are making, we are very ironical and making fun of Mr. Trump and so on. At the same time, this uh, process or this type of figures or figuration or political field was very much present with the, with the end of socialism. So that's just like to be clear on that side, uh, how uh, that farcical, figure of Trump has its tragic predecessor in the, in the former East or in Germany. So the revisionist archive of Yugoslavia that becomes dominant is very much in line with the critique that Rida poses on the dominant archives. So you have a centralized national space, Arche, new sovereigns, new Arhonts, who are in this case not just politicians, but also new historians, nouveau historian, if you want, a nouveau philosophe that gave revisionist interpretations of the past tragic and then, of course, heroic stages of the nation in becoming. So to this dominant national archive, I just oppose uh, this what I call counter archive. Um, this letter can be cle clearly aligned with what Benjamin would call certain tradition of the oppressed um, and some kind of legacy of uh, this counter, um, prefix counter, um, counter history, counter memory in Foucault or in Mirzov's terms, counter visuality of popular here partisan artistic forms practiced by masses of more or less anonymous partisans. I'm inclined to take on the boat, also Deleuze and Guattari, when they speak about uh, counter memory and a concept of monument to revolution. So monument to revolution that kind of uh, not just testifies, but kind of um, refracts, re-envisions, echoes, you know, the, 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 the moment of these revolutionary ruptures into the future. So my plea for certain counter archive should not be seen as a, some kind of exotization of this space Yugoslavia that doesn't exist, but as a more invitation of forming uh, more systematic studies of uh, counter archival practices that kind of spread from anti-fascist partisan struggles in uh, south of Europe already before Second World War to uh, anti-colonial struggles. So kind of re-narrate also certain, um, certain history of 20th century. 
So um, you would remember already uh, well how Marx in 18 Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte uh, speaks that bourgeois revolution or also some other kind of reformation. He talks about Martin Luther, you know, borrow their names and poetry from the past. So there should be this orientation towards future, towards new language and modalities. So this topic, as you know, is not new. Most notably, the artistic avant-garde after October Revolution is tasked by uh, with uh, this ep epochal uh, project of monumental propaganda. But within this monumental uh, propaganda, you have um, impressive discussions and works and practices that kind of displace past and future, revolutionize through image and word. So how to think about the revolutionizing perceptions and how to revolutionize in terms of culture, forms of production and dissemination. So if there was ever a Marxist uh, conception of memory at that point, it was remembering the future. And if we add an image, it could be a projection of Vertos egalitarian movements of productive and also already reproductive activity in communist present future. So remembering future, as you can already now sense, will be one of the central criterion for the partisan archive in my, in my book, uh, for also selection of the works that I analyze. So works that were able to produce revolutionary temporality. So kind of this contradictory time between the not yet existing, so kind of this future, and um, between this retroactive uh, uh, efficacy. So what can give a strong articulation between rupture and memory of rupture? Then we have works that are obviously made outside the established bourgeois institutions and their canons, and their autonomy. Um, another criterion important is that selected artworks express specific surplus. So kind of a remainder and a reminder of a revolution that doesn't sit easily with state, state institutions. We can say that for capitalists now or our nation state, but also for, as I show in the chapter three, um, also in terms of like countering the kind of more mytho mythologizing aspect that was uh, uh, um, kind of part of the dominant uh, ideology um, at, in 60s, 70s. But I don't have time to go uh, there now. So in dialogue with Benjamin, he calls for to arms cultural history, right? At that time, to account for barbarism. So you know this uh, barbarism and the, uh, the, the documents of civilization. So he's focusing on some kind, some kind of violent surplus of state, empire, capital, that once we account for it, uh, might even perhaps open doors or gates to redemptive future. While, um, and this is my kind of small minor disagreement with the, with the work of Enzo Traverso, um, that instead of like sticking with the kind of this melancholy of the defeats of like kind of how left is always defeated and is not uh, actually going towards the ultimate victory, like in, in, in the Maoist slogan. Um, but I want to stress uh, kind of the need to nurture also this kind of rare but important victories of the oppressed. So to stress the surplus, not only just as violence, but as a revolutionary creativity of partisans and masses, experience of this not so many victories, but still those that can still mobilize us. So there is this question, is the, the power of the mourning of the defeat something that can mobilize you or even push you more to resignation? Or is it certain kind of also victories that even in the worst possible circumstances, it was possible to launch huge projects, um, not just political, but also cultural. So when we are speaking about um, recent historical rev revisionism, we are not talking just about totalitarian scare and uh, the, um, the anti-fascism that became um, much less potent, right? In construction of new Europe. 
this uh, pacification of anti-fascism has a much longer history. It should be noted that these experiences of partisan resistance and so on in Western Europe, but also in the East, uh, started becoming neutralized immediately after Second World War. So anti-fascism becomes only a fight against fascism, purified of any revolutionary transformation and at the best embedded in glorious national history. This, what I call telluric with Schmidt, this telluric arch archivization of struggle can be seen as flirting with Karl Schmidt's theory of partisan that grounds partisan in authentic national soil. So my argument is completely opposed to this uh, departure point, which is a very substantialist inscription, even though that it's a, uh, you know, it's such a formalist uh, 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 theoretical standpoint, it has a very substantial, uh, su substantialist inscriptions. So my arguments rather points out that partisan liberation in Yugoslavia was an actual revolution, which from beginning on is inscribed into a project of international anti-fascist solidarity. So liberation struggle was not identitarian, and it went against the dominant pre-war royalist dream of merging or melting of free tribes together in one nation, so Slovene Croats and Serbs, excluding the others, but in one nation of Yugoslavia. Rather, there was a kind of dialectical movement between national and social liberation. This is also like the work of Ozer and Pupovac uh, was very important Sunday, uh, 10 years ago, um, and has a very influential, important frame um, where he kind of differentiated between the um, kind of construction of kind of just people's sovereignty or kind of liberal nation state and the kind of revolutionary subjectivity. So liberation didn't just fight against fascism, but rather fought for a new world in quote of Tony Negri that late 60s, 70s comes to rehabilitate partisans. They say they wanted to seize by the new world by making, experiencing, experiencing and creating it. End of quote. This positive moment of liberation then relates to the work of masses, not only of intellectuals, artists, communist vanguard party. Liberation is deeply permitted by what I call subjectivization of mass or masses. They were constituting new counter institutions of mass democracy, but also aesthetical sensitivities, cultural empowerment. So partisan movement was predominantly consisting of peasants and workers. Um, of course, as already in the very introduction was said that there was a strong encounter between communist organization, women anti-fascist organization, new communist, um, let's say kind of as a more kind of disciplinary force of the movement or kind of uh, bringing the ideas which were then remolded within the masses and discussions and organizing. So this is also interesting when we are discussing about the political, cultural practice, theoretical practice. So within the cultural realm, despite um, liberation councils and communist party, of course, having certain political influence or were the backbone of the partisan liberation, uh, political commissars, propaganda sections, we cannot speak of certain central propaganda agency. Rather, it was decentralized self-organization that was at stake, um, was taking place in a very different liberated territories, which from 1941 um, in the autumn, you already had a liberated territory in, on the uh, uh, region of Užice, uh, which is almost as big as Slovenia. So this is September, October 41, where it's like occupation is hardcore in the whole Europe. There is already uh, liberated territories. And this kind of grows through 42, 43, 44. There are certain liberated territories that won't be occupied anymore. So they're really doing, you know, fighting against the occupation, but also against like civil war, against the old forces, collaborationist 
regimes. Um, so it's a, it's a very complex uh, struggle or power constellations. And within it, there is much given to a kind of self-initiative or initiative of those partisans that are active there. So also there is no internet or Zoom that we would just like communicate, hey, Tito say this, do this tomorrow. No, <laughs> for a few months, you wouldn't hear anything from anyone. So basically in, in this time you would, you know, uh, have to be organized politically, culturally, and militarily. So obviously partisan art, despite there was no kind of this um, pres uh, propagandistic prescription, and this is like one important debate, uh, is partisan art just like propaganda or is it like what would Miklaus Komel would uh, think just as an avant-garde project? Uh, it's neither, it's both, uh, my kind of uh, um, argument goes. Partisan art, of course, already from departure point is inscribed politically into the liberation project that imagine different world. You know, one important feature to stress is that there is this fascinating encounter between avant-garde groups and artists on the one hand and workers, peasants, many of whom who become literate in the times of war, right? So that the reading groups is not just, oh, we are now reading Marx, but we are reading in order to start reading. Right, so this is basically, and you don't have many books, uh, books circulate between the, the, the partisans and so on. So it's like the reading groups are also one inch fascinating uh, venue to discuss. Um, um, so, and also uh, interesting reversal, you will see that some avant-garde artists become more propagandistic, uh, more we go into the war, while um, those uh, anonymous partisans are those that become literate, uh, start to experiment with the hexameter, with the more formal means, poetic means. So this is another interesting point. So just to, to, to give you a notion what was happening, people were hungry, were hungry for food, of course, but they were hungry for liberated culture and change. During the struggle in Yugoslavia, some 40,000 poems and songs were written. In Slovenia, only 10,000. Um, some few thousands of them are also published. You can access them. Um, but this is, this is like uh, crazy. Just like to imagine now who will kind of uh, write and read this and they were publishing this. So you have this, then you have thousands of printed journals, journals, weeklies, um, thousands of graphic art, linoleum cuts, uh, thousands of photographs, uh, impressive array of theater performances and productions. They were, for example, uh, staging Moliere. Uh, you know, they were doing a short agitational theater as well. They were writing their no, uh, own uh, novellas and uh, stage plays. Yeah? Uh, there are even symphonies written by Cosina. Uh, in the times of war. Um, there are films that were produced in the most crazy circumstances you can imagine. You will have this in the book, you have some of these examples shown. Um, so now I'm already coming. Uh, how much time actually I have? I have still some time, no? I hope so, because I don't see anyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, okay. Let's say uh, I have a few more minutes, I just tell myself. Um, uh, I, I wanted to show you a few examples. Okay, presentation. Oh, it's here. Just a sec. Slideshow. Okay, this is what I wanted to show, the book. These are the liberated territories that I was talking uh, before. This is Ma May 1943. Um, and you would see 
probably there are also some liberated territories like in Greece and uh, in some other places. This focuses mo mostly and also in uh, on the Eastern Front. So where you have Belarus and Ukraine, there are some liberated zones. So it's not completely, it's like kind of Yugoslav standpoint, uh, let's call it. Um, and you would see uh, there is maybe like one half of territory or let's say 40% of territory was liberated. Um, so now to move to some um, examples, uh, partisan figure, um, this I analyze in, in the second chapter. Um, one of the most famous and recognized partisan liberation gesture is a raised fist and has been, as Didi Uberman pointed out, seen as important legacy of soulèvement, of uprisings, of liberations. It is on this space that an individual carries the name of the struggle and stands in for certain universalist idea. So in Yugoslavia, a famous partisan, Stepan Filipovic, that you see here, who makes himself immortal moments before being hanged, shouting up, death to fascism, freedom of people, freedom to people. Um, so, smrt um, fascismu, uh, svoboda, sloboda, narodo, which becomes uh, then a slogan even after uh, Second World War. Some people still use this initial when they sign the letter. You're sincerely, there was a smart fascism, Svoboda Narodo. Even uh, some old dinosaurs use it now. Uh, okay, so this is this is Stepan Filipovic, um, uh, who is a communist partisan and kind of shows that um, he is not uh, afraid of death. Um, then the certain uh, partisan female figures. Um, um, Lepa, Lepa Radic, which you see on the left, uh, she's executed in 1943. Um, and basically, she doesn't have so much public, it's just kind of uh, Nazis and collaborants. Um, and, um, but again, she's uh, very talkative and makes a lot of political statement and also launches premonitions because they ask her if, if she will betray uh, her comrades. And she says uh, uh, that, that not, and these comrades will hunt them forever till they die. And really the most of this uh, Prince Eugen uh, brigade um, uh, is killed in, uh, at the end of the war on the border of Slovenia, Croatia. Um, anyways, uh, beautiful moments of the past. Um, uh, then you have uh, uh, one fascinating uh, image that is then used also in, um, in Yugoslav times, Jena Oborbi, Woman in Struggle. This is uh, a, a journal of anti-fascist front of women in Croatia. Uh, it's in 1933. You have also Smart Fascismo, Sloboda, Narodo. And you have a presentation, a kind of maximal um, if you know, you have this kind of male uh, heroicism that has been present, you know, uh, through like early revolutions to kind of guerrilla struggles, guerrilleros. Um, you have also a very strong investment around uh, the, the woman who is also who um, anti-fascist women organization has like 2 million members. Um, it's a huge organization, uh, very important in political discussion in organization of the struggle. And uh, they also promote like, as you see the woman with the child with uh, writing the journal and fighting. There were around uh, 30,000 women that were also involved or even more in, 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 in the fighting, in the military struggle more. Um, so, but this is like kind of uh, on the level where I start on kind of more individual, what I wanted, uh, okay, this you see like um, um, uh, Doganova, he, she's uh, working on the, um, uh, uh, sculptures and uh, so it's part of partisan art of workshops, ateliers, then you have um, people in Slavonia, um, 
that are working on the printing shop uh, outside. A lot of them were illegal, were below, but there were also ones that were just like kind of outside. But what I really wanted to show you um, is like Partizansky sketchy, partisan sketches from 1943. What I call, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a drawing that was done by Dori Klemencic, who was assigned uh, an important role in partisan propaganda section in Primorska. Um, and this was sketch or drawing for poster that aims to, and I would um, claim quite successfully so, to represent the community in resistance. So kind of to move from this more kind of individual pardon, uh, figures of resistance to kind of this more collective uh, abstract kind of community in resistance, uh, actually kind of portraying what type of activities um, are not expecting what are happening within the partisan struggle. So it kind of redefines the notion of weapon, even for times of war. From the obvious rifle that you have, we move to a guitar, theater mask, and a book that are assembled under the, of course, new flag of Yugoslavia that carries a star. A poster expresses the equivalence of different arms used in struggle and puts on display a deeper solidarity between political, cultural, military work that aims for liberation. The lucid transfiguration displaces the individual partisan figure onto the struggle itself. Um, and then the last one, I hope I still have a little bit of time left. Yeah, let's say. Just a little uh, bit. Yeah, the, the very last, I will just... Uh, uh, so it's Franz Pinterich Schwaber. Mm, he's not anonymous, we know his name, but not very famous. Um, the original uh, poem was lost during the war. It survived only as a German translation. France was a fighter that was poisoned in 1942 by a local Nazi collaborator. No image remains of him, no real biography, no grave. All we have are his personal notes, which as it turns out are his poems. Uh, Pinterich notes can, came into hands of the Nazi with the help of the same collaborator that poisoned him, um, kind of translate into Germany and show that wanted to show maybe how low their morale was in the occupied territories. They were probably very surprised. These poems remain in Nazi hands, and by curious irony of history, they survive in Nazi archive. Toward the end of the war, partisans confiscated part of the archive, and these records are then moved to the archive of the new Socialist Republic, where they remain practically invisible and part of it translated at the end of the 80s, where there is already breakup of Yugoslavia and nobody's more interested in partisans or partisan culture from more affirmative way. They always already take it as something part of official ideology and there is already revisionism taking place. So I want to just read you um, what you have anyways on the screens, uh, why poems or what poems are written to. Um, we wrote poems in different times when we had nothing else to do. But today, when justice belongs to those in power, when weapons do the talking, our poem is loud and clear. We want to live, to live freely in a free land. This poem of ours is our guidance. It is our anthem. Victims are falling for these poems, innocent victims, and they're falling by the thousands. When this poem becomes a reality, when freedom approaches in all its light and power, come forward, you poets and writers, to the victims fallen for this poem. To write poems of eternal glory and memory. So this is one of presentation, a kind of poetic dispositive that brings together like kind of the past of like writing poetry and the future and this kind of present of rapture that is possible only in, in, in the time of struggle. So uh, I had a couple of other examples, but I will rest my case now. Thank you for attention. Thank you. Thanks very much. Do you want to stop sharing your screen and we'll go back to the main? Brilliant. Thank you very much. So let me call in uh, Angela Dimitrikaki now to uh, to respond in some way to, to Gal's thoughts. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Esther. So um, I've just prepared a few things because um, I had the honor of uh, reading the book uh, as it was coming out. So um, the response is more broadly to the book than to a girl specific presentation, although I've been taking notes throughout um, his talk. And I wanna start by saying that I had uh, great difficulty in deciding what I would like to highlight from uh, Gal's study, um, that it is the first book length study that would count for me at least as contemporary anti-fascist art historical research, that it has great headings, including um, the one that um, he mentioned, the primitive accumulation of revisionist memory. Although for me, the one that stands out even more is armed struggle and armed memory that it is an exemplary historical study in connecting diverse sites and articulations of aesthetics from poetry to film to public art, um, that it connects specifically Marxism to antifascism, that it discusses uh, a hideous um, European Union public art project. Um, that I'll come to that later or that I was moved when I read uh, the book for all sorts of reasons. Of all this and more uh, potential entries, I finally opted to focus on the book's emphasis on the urgencies we face. This is noted in the book's very first paragraph where we read about the sad fate of partisan monuments and the emergence of revisionist monuments in the post-Yugoslav uh, context. So that's a phrase that captures uh, the spirit of the times, I would say. It is this phrase that delivers the significance of this uh, and any research that addresses the de facto politicization of memory and the role of art as public act in this process. And what is the role of theory in all this? Um, this book indicates that it is huge and complex. And I'm just going to uh, mention uh, in this paper two things in relation to this. So I'll move on to discuss the first, which I call identification and defragmentation as the work of theory. The first task, it seems, uh, which, um, of this book was to create a new field and I quote from page 25, the work of critical counter archival studies consists in systematizing and articulating counter archival traces and effects, how such counter histories and memories of an emancipated past will be remediated, retold and resocialized in the present in the form of a new emancipatory politics is not only a theoretical task, but also entails a political practice that remains to be awakened in our present and for our future." Unquote. So in this description of the studies field, the reference to an emancipated past stands out. This phrase only makes sense if we admit, uh, as we should, that we're not in an emancipated present, which is true, we're not. We are in a notable counter-revolutionary moment despite the many parallel and intersecting struggles going on. The partisan counter-archive, the book, does exactly this. It speaks about one struggle and it is this oneness that is identified by the author as its political aesthetics, which is where the concept of identification comes in. I think that this is a finding of this research that is worth thinking about. The counter in the counter archive does not just collect fragments of a dispersed memory. It articulates memory as a totalizing process that, that is it defragments, a word that um, perhaps I had to make up as I was reading the book. And I have to note here this incredible question, is there a Marxian theory of memory that uh, Gal mentioned uh, before, which I think this would be the response to this. 
So of course, a totalizing uh, process is not an when it comes to memory is not an exclusive feature of a left politics of memory, but it plays a particular role for this politics so undermined by the hegemony of capital. It seems that here we have a very different articulation of memory than the one that the epistemologists of postmodernism identified as useful to the emancipatory struggles of that era, the 70s and 80s, including feminism, which is uh, my own uh, my principal, also on the fascism, of course, my principal field of uh, research. I also think this can be a helpful observation for contemporary anti-fascist struggles, as it indicates that unearthing bits and pieces of a suppressed history is not enough, but that we need instead a very brave narrative of memory that generates a transgenerational trans continuum. So the author also points to a specificity of antifascism as witnessed in Yugoslavia, that, and I quote again, the partisan liberation struggle represented the only political force that was open to all nations and nationalities, to men and women. That's on page 33. Um, one wonders if antifascism can be conceived in any other terms, though, more broadly. If it can, then is it antifascism? The case study of this study provides nonetheless an important uh, precedent for this criterion of antifascism that can be useful to us today. There is a broader sense then of defragmentation that, uh, that this study provides. There's a lot more to say about this, but I will move on to my second point, uh, being very mindful of time which concerns monuments and materials, the occupation of public space. So this is the heading I've given it. And I start with um, a quote again, um, actually two quotes, one from page uh, 191, where we read, like the partisan films, monuments to the PLS were a priority for the new socialist state between 1945 and 1990. A thousand, several thousand monuments to the PLS were erected, uh, erected across all Yugoslavia. It is no secret that the production of partisan monuments or monuments to revolution, the PLS, was formally influenced by the Alliance of Veterans Association of the People's Liberation War of Yugoslavia, founded in 1947. And the second quote from uh, the next page, 192, uh, says that um, a large majority of the monuments erected in the first 10 years after the war were built in a broadly uncontrolled manner and were not directed by the party apparatus. So the author describes this as self-initiated memorial practices. And although his case study focuses on revolution, these observations are highly relevant to a broader analysis about the contemporary public space, the monuments in it, and the commemoration of events that may appear mundane when isolated, when seen as uh, a series of disconnected events, that is, but of the fabric of rupture when, when taken together. This characterization, mundane, is of course not the one I want to be using, but I use it here only to highlight how this actually um, horrific, eminently political events that sometimes surround us are treated by hegemonic ideology. Athens, my hometown, and where I am right now, has witnessed a number of such events. Uh, the best known uh, among them of recent years, perhaps being the police shooting of 15 year old schoolboy Alexis Grigoropoulos in uh, December, 2008, and the public lynching of queer activist uh, Zako Stopoulos in uh, September, 2018, done in broad daylight by two shop owners near a very central Athens square called Omonia, uh, with the help of the police. Both murders have marked the divided public memory of Greek society, 
uh, to an extent that I can't possibly, um, I think, articulate here. As is known, huge riots followed upon the police murder of, uh, of the schoolboy Alex Grigoropoulos, initiating, in fact, a new cycle of struggles in Greece, for which this country is best known in the past um, 10 years. To this day, there is a tentative marking of the actual spot of the shooting. And regarding uh, Zach, the, most, uh, the more recent murder, his torture and murder actually uh, shook up the queer community in Greece, in fact, making it more of a community. And this event is also still, has just received a tentative marking of the site of the murder, despite the many uh, mobilizations. Now, as the trial of the accused was starting recently, uh, um, the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Institute published a very important edited volume titled Queer Politics, Public Memory. In my own essay, including the volume, I addressed precisely the lack of monuments, of memorials of such events, and overall the fact that soft, ephemeral, or near invisible materials are used in cases where the state has not authorized the commemoration. What is more interesting is that contemporary art favoring overall um, uh, favoring overall the ephemeral and the not loud has accepted this divide. There is an acceptance that artistic interventions about events that disturb, like a social poltergeist, the consensus that keeps together the status quo will be soft. A big statue of the murdered uh, people in the central of Zach, for instance, in the, in the central Athens district where he was murdered would be unthinkable. Instead, commemoration takes place through clandestine actions on the city walls and very soft markings. So the question I want to raise here in narrating all this is that the commemoration of such events belongs to the space, to that space as commons entailing always precarity while public space as commemorative space belongs to the state and its authorized agents entailing permanence reflected indeed in the materials used and i could bring on returning to the themes of the books of the book um, the example of sanya ivakovic a creation a celebrated creation um, artist and her mom uh, her monument to revolution which he tried to create in Athens, facilitated at the time by Documenta 14, just a few years back. Um, perhaps we can refer to this uh, events later on. For my point uh, in this case is that this study, the uh, Gull study, can help us understand in a rather unique way for European culture, the differentiations of the political context where the tendency just described can be observed. The map provided in the book on page 197 shows the Yugoslavia covered with monuments to revolution and actually looking at one slide uh, that Gal showed before I now see that this, the map that I saw in the book is very similar to the slide actually showing where the um, struggle was carried out. So anyway, the map in the book shows Yugoslavia covered with monuments to revolution. The map is a striking sight, and it certainly corroborates the author's conclusion, and I quote again, that it is not an exaggeration to claim that the East developed a more complex and elaborate monument to revolution and victory over fascism than the West. That's on page 197. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, is a clear understatement. And this in turn, nonetheless, can help us grasp the extent to which public space in the West has been and continues being a counter-revolutionary space. I think this has important and historical implications for a future reinterpretation of public art as genre on which volumes have been written. I mean, I remember 
as part of like my academic career and before as doctoral student, I, I, I was hardly reading about anything else. So volumes have been written about public art, including by left art historians, but for wheat, such an assessment would still be alien. I mean, there is, you will try very hard, I think, to find uh, references to, to the extent that uh, public art functions as uh, a counter-revolutionary um, memory. Gull's discussion of the European Union's plans for a pan-European memorial for the victims of totalitarian violence in Brussels, which I also discussed at the former uh, Historical Materialism London conference paper on anti-communism that was back in 2018, is the most telling example of who and what occupies public, so-called public space. And in fact, I remember the time that I read, I was reading with great interest, the process through which Greek political parties came to even accept the August 23rd European Day of Remembrance, initially standing against it. But as we moved uh, forward in time, uh, as the counter-revolution was becoming deeper, let's see, obviously things changed. Gaul raises a number of uh, pertinent questions around the, our, I would call them the Arendian politics of this uh, public art commission. Future research on the hegemony articulated in European public space can build on his analysis that nationalism and the religious fundamentalism of today um, would fill the void after the folding of socialism were predicted by Frederick James long before they happened. So if you read the political unconscious, you'll find it there. The analysis offered by the partisan counter archive revives in my view at least the prospect of a self-reflection that connects art and the left, which is something quite different to the generalities we're used to about art and society. And I'm gonna stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Angela. That's really, um really useful and good. So let me now bring in Sezgin for his contribution to the debate. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. And Gal, really congratulations. Good work. Actually, not only one book, but there are two books that Gal published this year. I read only one. Actually, not about what we are supposed to discuss today, partisan ruptures. It's a, it's a really interesting work and actually resonates this, uh, this work that you have developed in, in Partisan Counter Archive. Like already in the cover of this book, which is published by Pluto Press, I got it in April from Gal with the exchange books. It is in the cover, we see Monument to the Revolution by Dushan Jamonia. Actually, we see the big monument in Kozara Mountain It is a memory to a partisan struggle, but the artist which did this project is, was actually uh, an abstract, non-figurative artist. So this is like already quite an in, important segment in, in Gal's research. And we've been collaborating with Gal on, on few occasions that actually bring forward these ideas of avant-garde art and abstract progressive art in Yugoslavia and their political implications. Well, I will be very, I try to be very short now and just to kind of propose one speculative question at the end. Like, I think the main thesis and actually the, the difficult question of Gauss project in this two book is how to find the right language to discuss like a, like a symbolic values of memories of socialist Yugoslavia 
in thinking about new horizons in revolutionary politics. Already Esther mentioned in the beginning, like Gal's book actually resonates with the contemporary political projects and which is quite much emphasized in introduction to partisan counter archive. And this is what it meant to be today in opposing the nationalist sort of mobilization of memory. So he calls for, as we heard, partisan counter archive as opposing to reactionary and nationalist primitive accumulation of memory, which he equates in many places this primitive accumulation also with the primitive, accu primitive accumulation of wealth after dissolution of Yugoslavia and destruction of social ownership of socialist Yugoslavia. So there is like something correlating between this symbolic primitive accumulation and the, 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 the economic and the political primitive accumulation happening. So this actually, I think we can condense your like a question of your book to how it's possible to remember as future, if I can formulate in this way. And what is most important in this question is like how to actualize this, these symbolic values of memory for the service of revolutionary politics. And also for a Marxist research as you emphasize bringing a lot of difficulty. But for example, very straightforward question would be like, can memory have an emancipation pot potential? Because it, was so, it is so much charged with the nationalistic appropriation of memory. So because you already mentioned this dialectics between memory and history, which always has to be dealt whoever is taking this Marxist and revolutionary position. And especially knowing there is such a strong cultural industry behind these memory projects. So this your project, I mean, at the core of not only of your project, but also of many studies dealing with Yugoslavia is to find out some very interesting segments of Yugoslavian socialist history, which is like, self-management, non-alignment, and of course the genuine partisan, form of genuine partisan struggle. And a lot of these questions has been put forward by the studies, which is now called Yugoslavian studies, and is now, I would say, enjoying quite a bit of the popularity in academic world. But I think, your position, Gal's position, and there are a few other researchers, represents a bit different trend. And in this perspective, I think I would include myself to this perspective as well, is like seeing in Yugoslavia a singular experience of revolutionary practice and theory, which can also engage in the more larger topics, larger discussions that are not about this pessimistic and uh, fatalistic question of breakup of Yugoslavia always ending into this real politic. So of course, the main historical reference in all this discussion is often national liberation struggle or partisan struggle. So, I would like to mention now, like what would be the thesis of these discussions of this other more revolutionary project dealing with Yugoslavia is as to what extent symbolic values of memory, let's say partisan memory, can help us in understanding the singularity of Yugoslavia or Yugoslavian project. Well, First of all, for those who listen and are not familiar of this strand, because most of what has been published about Yugoslavia or what is popular as a Yugoslavian studies is available in Anglo-Saxon world, in English language. And it is quite well circulated in academic world. 
but not this trend and not this perspective, not this revolutionary position, which often happened outside of these main academic national institutions and parallel engage in a very hybrid forms of organization involving also contemporary art practices. Plus, a very open, I would say, activistic or declared political position. Let's say it is a perspective which is positioning itself toward the questions of class, exploitation, state, and nation, and all these things. So a few would should be mentioned now here, like, for example, some platforms in Ljubljana, like Boretz, which is the continuation of this. Uh, Boretz is a journal, which is published by like a partisan memory, uh, let's say, institutions already in socialist Yugoslavia, but continuing. And there happened quite interesting theoretical artistic discussions. And I could mention Aggregate Journal and Workers Park Punks University. Also, there was in Zagreb a lot of artistic manifestations dealing with these topics. I should also mention Active. And perhaps most systematically of all, discussions happened in journal Prelom, published in Belgrade, which means break. And Gal collaborate with most of them. So this is this. It, it is important to know this, let's say, this arch that it was quite an, quite a, there exists quite a rich, rich material taking into account of that perspective of memory in, I would say, after 2000s. So, yeah, also we could mention that this. I mean, what was the, what is the most interesting, I would say, benefit in this perspective, in, of, of this perspective in engagement with the artistic practices, what this project benefited is that it is more advanced understanding of form or formation and especially the materialistic aspect of symbolic formations, because we're talking about memory here. And so Gal already mentioned perhaps the most interesting or most, let's say, the uh, ambitious project up until now was is the Miklos Komel's huge 500 pages, How to Think Partisan Art. And also before that, interventions of Rastko Mochnik in discussing discussing the partisan press and the role of that that cultural forms in later Yugoslavian Yugoslavian, let's say, theory and practice. So, question is: What are the materialistic effects of this symbolic partisan memory? and how these effects can be detected, and where are they? Of course, the most easy answer, because we deal with the symbolic practices of memory, which are concretizing in certain statues or artwork or films, is this subjectivity, the question of subjectivity. And this question, the thesis of the subjectivity, often appearing also in your book, books, especially partisan ruptures, which is taking this Althusserian standpoint of these breaks that are kind of determining the, the, the force of these symbolic, symbolic formations. But insisting on this subjective politics or subjectivity in this Yugoslavian revolutionary politics regarding the memory has another interesting contribution, I think, 
it is when we start to think of Yugoslavia outside of, let's say, national liberation struggle. So what I am here trying to say is that when we start to think of Yugoslavia after 1948, up to 80s, mid 80s, we have a lot of, we have an amazing contradictory and turbulent, turbulent periods. And especially it was manifesting in, in contradictions of self-management socialism. Because self-management socialism, which was meant to be a complete social ownership, collectivization of the ownership, withering away of the state, has also relapsed into some sort of financialization of marketization of this, of this like hybrid economy in, in Yugoslavia. And that generated quite a big unresolved tensions and contradictions. And these are the topics of partisan ruptures, self-management, market reform, and the specter of socialist Yugoslavia. So if we're gonna talk about, if we're gonna make sense of that specter of Yugoslavia, first of all, we have to deal with that, with that contradictions, with that very difficult to handle a question of existence of liberalism, technocratism, and doses of the private ownership in Yugoslavia, within the self-management. So how to think of revolutionary subjectivity in these conditions? and how to actualize Yugoslavia with all this baggage, with all these difficult, difficult, let's say, uh, conditions. I mean, here I would make a little jump to the back. I like to think of this situation of Yugoslavia in comparison with communism after revolution in Soviet Union, especially with NEP, new economic policy. And to see in which way the artistic avant-garde and some theoretical productions were confronting the contradictions of NEP, which mean, meant economical Economical compromise, NEP, this is how I would like to define. Economical compromise in order to keep the politics, the revolution, to give the primacy to a revolutionary politics. So the compromise was happening only on the economical level. So what here actually happened, what there happened during the NEP period was that subjectivity was completely pushed toward the political side and economy was an, left as like objective condition, which is of the dialectics Gal, you are also working on. And you are in, in few places mentioning also like a, you are comparing NEP to Yugoslavian self-management socialism, which of course in Yugoslavia this lasted not only four years, but four decades. And those, the heaviness of this tension was more, more present. But what happened during the NEP in Russian avant-garde? Just like stenographic, so very quick presentation. Actually, the most interesting avant-garde forms appeared then. That was the time when Malevich introduced or was involving with Inkuk and the Institute of Artistic Cultures, where the extrinsic element that was completely kept away from the suprematist apparatus were introduced to this non-objective art, and it did not simplify the forms, but contrary complicated 
and expand it to the whole possible fields from architecture, design, film, etc. Ziga Vertov, all his films are dealing with NEP, with the contradictions of NEP. But what is very interesting, and that would be my speculative question, and with this I'm finishing, is the new things that happened in poetry, which actually, as such, is the, is the most, let's say, the artistic expression unrelated to economical condition. Because if you are making a film, like for example, in Yugoslavian case, we could deal with the black wave films and all these other expressions, which are very reflecting to this, very, very reflecting on these uh, contradictions. But film is a big apparatus. Film is conditioned by the economical apparatus. And as such, it is conditioned by the contradictions that are inherent in the economy. In this case, the marketization in Yugoslavia. But the poetry and such artistic expressions are full exist existing on that subjective level where the political revolutionary form can be further developed. That in case of Soviet Union, I think best example is Lev, led by Mayakovsky, Lev Front of Art, and their journal, which bring together the best theoreticians from formalists and the poets belonging to futurists and coming up with the complete hybrid interesting form. And it is not, inter it, is not uh, it is not a coincidence that in 1924, when Lenin died, there is no none of the artists, especially belonging to these circles, who haven't written anything about Lenin. And the reason is because Lenin was the one behind new economic policy. And the contradictions of that new economy policy was unresolved. And this unresolved situation actually was very much determining of taking this of what, what sides the, uh, these artists were taking. So in Yugoslavia, also we have, I mean, these, these cases of, of poets, these the cases of experimental poets working in uh, in 60s and 70s who, who have sort of built the theory of layer poetic practice through that through that very revolutionary uh, form of the self-management socialism i mean i was really happy to see that you are finalizing your your uh book with a poem by Branko Milković. Uh, in this, in this like uh, now presentation that I will finish, I want to mention one more, which is the, which is the, who is a, who is a, a poet living, lived and worked in Vojvodina, in Novi Sad, Vujica Reshin Tucic. Quite an interesting poet, mostly worked on mostly worked on the uh, visual and concrete poetry. And now we are translating a bunch of his texts that are from mid 70s until mid 80s, actually seeing in poetry a new language that can address, that can address this, the most interesting, most concrete questions of regarding the, the potential of the Yugoslavian revolutionary project. Uh, I want to share one image of, of this, uh, of Wojca Reshin Tutsic, a portfolio he published in 1982 in a journal called Pitanya in Zagreb. And this is uh, actually a portfolio of visual poems or visual novel called Struganje Mašte, which means scrapping the imagination. 
Earlier on, he worked also with his work in progress poem, complete zone kind of distillation of the Yugoslavian political language into a book called Reform Grotesque. Of course, they're playing with, with like, I can now share with you. Yes. So here is, yeah, here is the first page of, of this uh, publication, which looked like this kind of expression of found linguistic materials of, as he would explain, the echoes of this objective and subjective dialectics of violence, of politics, and all these economical reforms and, and uh, things like that. But the first page is a very interesting. We see there uh, a partisan ready to throw the hand grenade to a myth. And in, and in this particular image, I really find the condensation of this poetic sort of answer, poetic answer to how symbolic values of memory, like usually to do with a myth, can be confronted is in fact, of course, the, the liberal discourse is based on that critique that Yugoslavian socialism was exploiting the partisan myth. And I have to say, the topic that I wrote a PhD about is a black wave filmmakers also were, let's say, thinking in that terms, more or less. But here you have a very different approach that partisan, in fact, is, which is sort of like a symbolic capital, was symbolic capital in socialist Yugoslavia, throwing a bomb to the myth. And, uh, and then what it follows in, a, in a other works of Ruiz Aresh in Tutsic is a complete, let's say, separation and uh, and creating a, a new language out of that what is scattered here and there in this existing like a uh, uh, environment of of the self management so yeah i i just wanted to present this one example as as like to enrich the the uh, the examples of in of from Yugoslavia. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gal, Angela and Sezgin. I'd just like to remind those of you watching us on YouTube that we'll be very happy to take some questions via the comments uh, or comments via the comments. Please just type type them in. But while you're doing that. Um, I, I wanted to come back to Gal. I mean, I think there was so much there from those two uh, extraordinary responses. I mean, it, it struck me in a sense that Angela was um, placing things within a much broader politics of memory, European politics of memory, um, and, and anti-fascist struggle, whereas Sezgin was going in for something very specific about the specificities of, of Yugoslavia and the contradictions of um, a certain kind of mixed economic form in a way and, and the sort of formal possibilities and artistic possibilities that opens up. So two very different but complementary responses. So Gal, is there anything you would like to come back on, uh, obviously, in relation to, to all of that material? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, really, 
I really like this kind of uh, reply and respo uh, responses that go um, in the core of, of the work, but that at the same time expand and reach and um, also point out uh, certain resonances uh, in politics and the engaged theory. Um, what um, maybe struck me first to Angela, um, um, and this is this question of the monument and public space and reappropriation. I mean, there are like kind of different uh, strategies, the more kind of this right wing and official after 89 was very skillful, you could say, because it wasn't coming just like top bottom. It was also from below, it was a reappropriated old monument, for example, instead of a red star, you would have a new national flag. Uh, so they wouldn't completely erase the um, historical memory, but they would already insert, uh, you know, new uh, forms or the heraldics and so on. So uh, um, this was one, and uh, it struck me um, when you were saying, um, that some of these events like police murder or shop owners killing in Athens, uh, like different like anti-fascist or gay activists and stuff, um, uh, that uh, kind of the new artistic practices are then kind of completely con content, but there is some kind of consensus to, uh, for this ephemerality uh, uh, for certain let's say also precarious form it also has to do with the kind of if you look at it a, a longer um, canonization or these kind of counter monumental practices that were of course valuable and precious in the 90s kind of you know um, disentangling or criticizing kind of the state narratives in kind of more general let's say west european frame but also like kind of on the holocaust uh, memorials uh, but were critical towards uh, essentially kind of this old romanticist model of pedagogical monument right um, so then you would have also through art certain uh, different practices that kind of would use these techniques and strategies um, but yes sometimes you are just like kind of perplexed uh, not to have that there is not the flexibility to make still a very strong gesture in the public space that has to inscribe certain critical pedagogy and can be subtle it can be interactive it can be it doesn't have to be just like one or the other, right? So that was one of the kind of lessons that already in 60s, 70s, um, that these monuments to revolution um, kind of developed that within such a genre, it's not film, it's not poetry, maybe um, more easy to experiment, you know, with, uh, let's say, prescription from the party or the state. But uh, you would have pretty, you know, defined uh, the, the canon there is, but they would kind of rupture within this form, um, making certain very, on one side, modernist, big monuments, but at the same time, making them uh, much more interactive, agile. And what is also a fascinating part in uh, the Yugoslav context, that many of them are located in nature. So you would think that, you know, the Yugoslav political uh, authorities would be, let's call it strategic or smart enough to put them in, in the cities to reach everyone. They are located, of course, where partisan liberation struggle was like had its basis or liberated territories, but it's in the nature, in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's like, so it's uh, basically when you are going there, and it's like in times of socialism, student, uh, it would be like student trips or school, uh, school uh, kids would be going there or people just like having picnic and stuff. But there is some kind of interesting play between this monument or kind of anti-fascist revolutionary form and the nature. 
right? So kind of what over the term is, you can read it again in this kind of modernist, you know, um, Magnitogorsk, what uh, Sezgin was like, uh, it's the period after it, right? Uh, the total destruction and ruination through this strong modernization. Um, at the same time, kind of this very strong memorial modernization that has these different tendencies in Yugoslavia. So that that could be like a little bit as a response to this uh, response. Um, maybe one um, question that was present in both. Um, so if there is some kind of emancipatory core or emancipatory potentiality in the memory or kind of monument making uh, these pr practices, um, I could tell you a few interesting examples. Um, there is a, a fascinating, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, women choirs or self-management choirs that are present in different post-Yugoslav uh, uh, space and uh, people taking uh, quite seriously a revolutionary, not just partisan legacy, a revolutionary feminist legacy and uh, making the songs uh, uh, um, much more engaged process. So uh, uh, intervening in the protest, uh, going uh, uh, and commemorating things in a different way. So kind of um, what I try to kind of just uh, implicitly position myself. Uh, um, so against anti-totalitarianism, you would have a kind of this more subcultural uh, a response or commodification that would be Yugo nostalgia, some kind of uh, yearning for uh, a certain past that was not there, right? Or kind of just uh, by the old veteran um, um, generations, um, but something that would make um, sense and uh, would be again gripping, you know, the people, the public and going into these different, uh, intervening in these different situations. Then you have also one fascinating example in Mostar. You would, uh, you probably heard about this um, uh, partisan uh, cemetery by Bogdan Bogdanovich that was like vandalized already many times. And uh, it's also a venue of um, uh, important actions of people from the Croatian and Bosnian Muslim part coming together in anti-fascist, working together uh, across the ethnical and religious and this kind of double identification uh, um, dominance that is there. So um, there is there are moments and actions that kind of um, really went beyond this kind of more nostalgic uh, temptation or. Uh, this kind of memory that can kind of then freezes in the past instead of kind of opening it into the future. So that that is a little bit uh, on this. And to um, say again what you say, it's a very complex uh, question and point. Uh, probably we have to do uh, at some point, the uh, next uh, uh, launch with partisan rap ruptures. Uh, but you are totally, uh, I mean, one could specify if you would be speaking very strictly about the NIP um, and self management. Uh, I mean, even self management had its very different phases from kind of worker self management that came in the 50s and it's interesting because this is a reform that is top bottom, but it wants to do Soviets. This idea, idea of worker self-management is to kind of make Leninist or kind of Leninist. It's a kind of idea of Soviet within the economy, right? It's like workers councils. And it's uh, first tested in 100, 200 companies and then spread. And then interestingly, it's, becomes a kind of mechanism of social reproduction. So self-management becomes social form of how the society is organized and where the property relations, or if you want to say ownership, is not anymore owned by the state and it's not anymore owned 
by the private, let's say, or the technocracy, but it's from everyone and no one. That's why I say it in some um, sub chapters that this is already commons in practice, in state practice, right? The commons that we are talking uh, with Negri and different people in the last 15, 20 years, um, it had its state form with all its shortcomings, failures and contradictions. I agree, but uh, it is one case that uh, one can draw quite uh, substantial lessons from. So this is, this is maybe one, um, one question to take. So, and to be more specific, the uh, market reform that started in 1965, right, in Yugoslavia, it's kind of 61 is a smaller reform, but 65 is this big market reform that wants to decentralize, de-etatize, right? So it's not just withering away of capital, but also withering away of state. So it's a huge mess, uh, what kind of experiment is going on. And then all these politicians and legal uh, thinkers are uh, more occupied with the economy doing crazy things and kind of flexibilizing also workforce. Uh, don't remember, uh, don't forget the uh, guest workers and flexibilization of European market happening at that time. Um, so, yeah, um, I would say that like really this NIP was from 65 to 73. So it's also like kind of short time in which um, there is unprecedented relative autonomy given to the, to the sphere of art. Uh, culture. So you have a lot of experimentation that goes is criticizing it at the same time, affirming it. Uh, there is this ambivalence that is also seen in the memory towards the parties and sometimes it's completely absent or they would just like criticize this is stuff for workers. So kind of also very anti-workerist elitist positions by some cultural uh, um, productions and so on. Uh, but then you have people that are really engaged, like Zelimir Zilnik um, in, inside the film um, uh, scene, uh, making what they call partisan film in partisan way. So he goes between uh, 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 farmers of Vojvodina and uh, who were, some of them were partisans, most of them were anti-fascists, so supporting and reconstruct collective memory from below with his camera and stuff. And it's beautiful method. It's a, a beautiful film. And uh, it's then taken out of dissemination for the next 15 years. He anyways goes to the West, West Germany, he has problems there. Anyways, that's a discussion for some other time. Uh, but um, yeah, I would say that uh, there is a very interesting dynamic like Unconsciously, one uh, ha I mean, consciously, one have to be one has to be careful that uh, you know you, one doesn't come to this uh, kind of hypothesis that market, like even socialist market, is good for art or something like that. But definitely, I would subscribe to the thesis that because of this uh, intense contradiction and unresolvedness, where this is going to go, right? Uh, the communist project. Because of that, there was such a multiplicity of artworks and actions and so on. So this uh, kind of brings me to the core of the counter archive as such. Like I've, um, I, I read you like one partisan anthem, like partisan poem. The interesting thing at that point was there was like hundreds of partisan anthems. Anthems that were supposed to be bearing the essence of liberation or the new state or of Tito. No, you had like every brigade had its own anthem. Women had anthem, uh, like the, the, the uh, special groups had it and so on, so proletarians had it. So this is, uh, there was some kind of this strong multiplicity uh, that was at work, that was enriching uh, both artistic and political space. So if I answer it a little bit, I could say a bit more, but maybe we uh, pick up some. Yeah. Well, I think I'm. we're really conscious of time and especially we're starting late and uh, some of our panelists are already 
at 10 30 so um yeah i think we should probably draw things to a close um so let me just make the generic announcements which are to remind everybody to go to the website because there are discounts on historical materialism journal and historical materialism books which need to be supported in order for these events to take place especially this year in the absence of our money spinning conference so um please support us um and and get our materials uh also, you probably don't need to be reminded of the fact that the program continues until the afternoon of the 15th of November. So several other sessions, please go to the website and register. Um, that's the announcements out of the way. And I suppose I just really want to, to thank the participants. Uh, and the time has sort of just disappeared in a flash with so much uh, valuable and fascinating material that's the stuff for many more discussions um and so i i really just want to thank gal kern and seskin boynik and angela dimitrikaki and uh hope thank you God. the purpose of this was also for you to to get hold of gal's book or books uh which are truly extraordinary extremely fascinating and also all the books of seskin and angela and everybody involved <laughs> so thank you all for tuning in thank you audience and thank see you, you thank you bye, bye.